Good. Awesome. All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to our 119th episode of Lead Up for Women, Speak Up to Lead Up. I think I've said this every week for the last three weeks. I'm just blown away at, at w- how far we've come with Lead Up for Women podcast. Um, you know, I started this back in February of 2019 with Voice America um, as a radio show. And I was leading their women's empowerment series uh, mm. that they had. And I was so excited to be able to, um, to be able to do that. And at first I was like, no, 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 I don't wanna be a podcast host. I have no idea what I'm doing. And then they're like, we have like 3.5 million uh, listeners that are females. I was like, sign me up. Where do I get <laughs> signed up, right? It's all about getting your message out there. And sometimes, you know, we're going to be talking a lot about being an athlete of your success today. Sometimes you have to push your mental game past what you really think is is possible for you or what you can do. And I didn't think I could be a very good radio host or podcast host at that time. And so I had to push myself past that and just jump in with both feet and say, I'm going to do this no matter what it takes and make it a success. I go back and I listen to some of the first episodes I've ever done. And I said the word um about 95 times throughout the first <laughs> podcast. I don't ever say the word um anymore. You know, I don't sit and use filler words a lot because I'm more, I'm more confident in my ability to be a podcast host. And guess what? It's just being me. So I'm going to give that little tidbit to all of you today is mm-hmm. just be you, just show up as you and don't worry so much about what other people are doing or how they're running their podcast or how they're able to do something or not do something. What makes you memorable, what makes you unique is you being you. And I have a friend of mine who I wanted to talk to you was on my last episode right here. She was on our last issue of our magazine this July, uh, May, June issue that just came out not too long ago. Sharon Lecter, for many of you that know her, Think and Grow Rich. Yep. So she was in the Think and Grow Rich series, worked with Richard Kiyosaki for all of that. Um, I'm sorry, Rich Dad, Poor Dad was Richard Kiyosaki in the Napoleon Hill Foundation. She just wrote a book, Think and Grow Rich for Women, and then her latest one is Exit Rich, but she's done a lot of work with the Napoleon Hill Foundation. Uh, So this lady has been going strong, and there's been a lot that she has stepped into. You know, she was a CPA. That's how she started. Now she's known as like the world's best financial literacy um, advocate. So, you know, she just started as a CPA working in an office. And this is what she's become today. So uh, definitely pick up the latest copy. We have a free link for you below. You can click on that and get the latest digital copy. And also see all of the amazing articles that our members write. You know, these articles are about their stories. They're about business fundamentals, leadership, lifestyle, business. Anything that you need is there for you to read about. We even have a section in the philanthropy about fathers. So just a wonderful magazine, great read. It's always, it makes me feel warm and fluffy when I read the magazine because there's just such wonderful messages that the women are sending. So let's jump right in today. For all of you watching on Facebook today, uh, we invite you to come over to our Facebook page at Lead Up For Women. Of course, go to our website, leadupforwomen.com. We have tons of events every week that are free, uh, but it's just a great, safe and nurturing environment for women. Uh, There's no judgment here. There's no mean girls here. This is all about supporting each other in our path to success. We each have our own path. And we're going to talk a lot about that today and how you can be the leader of your own business and of your own path, because I've invited Carol Boston to be with me today. And she is the queen of Reframe. She is the business leadership coach. So let me tell you a little bit about her, and then I'll invite her on to have a conversation with me. So Carol's an award-winning speaker and an international best-selling author. Can't wait to hear about that book. And like I said, she's also known as the queen of reframe, who helps you reframe any challenge so you can double or triple your income in record time. Carol knows this. My ears are perked. I'm all about helping women earn more money. She brings the discipline of being a professional athlete and the savvy of 27 years of experience as a sales expert, another key piece in Fortune 100 companies like AT&T, Sprint, and Paychecks to Bear for her clients. Her clients say she's relentless, this is great, in supporting them to get the results they want. Carol helps female business owners to know their value, own their power, huge, and advocate for themselves. 
So they rise up and become the lioness leaders they're created to be. Oh, Carol, welcome <laughs> to the show, lady. You are speaking my language. Good. I'm glad to be here. <laughs> <laughs> I think that they're like, wow, Colleen's so happy right now. You can tell because Carol is like her kind of person. That is exactly what we believe in here in Lead Up for Women. It's what we preach. It's what we want every female to know about herself, that you have everything you need already right there inside of you. It's just a matter of tapping into that power, bringing it to the forefront and applying it into your life. So Carol, you have to share with us that your years of being an athlete to what you're doing today, how did that get translated, right? Because you've been an athlete for a long time. You've been in sales. You've been in corporate America like me, very yeah. dale, you know, male dominated. They're all male dominated in industries because they created every industry. So, <laughs> but we can leverage that strength yes. of us working in corporate. So how have you been able to do that? Oh my goodness. Um, I was raised in the country between two brothers. As a matter of fact, my dad put me on a softball team when I was five years old and we had cow patties for bases. <laughs> I never learned how to slide to this day. I don't slide. <laughs> and then fast forward, we moved to a bigger town and, and I was raised in the deep South. So there's spoken and unspoken rules about how little girls are supposed to behave. And when I was in, now think about this, this is 1971. I was the first girl to play little league hardball on the boys team. I played shortstop and my mother, she was embarrassed. I was not being a little girl. Now I had my, thank goodness I had my dad cheering me on on the sidelines, right? So fast forward, I'm, I'm 13 years old and my dad says, let's go play tennis. And I said, well, what's that? He goes, oh, it's a lot like baseball, you can play. So we went out, I tried for about 30 minutes and I walked up to the net, you won't believe this. And I put the racket down and I looked at my dad. I said, don't you ever ask me to do this again. You brought me out here to embarrass me. Fast forward two years, I'm on the swim team, and I noticed that my peers would go down and play tennis in between. Now, I told you, I came from a very competitive environment, so I was like, well, if they can do it, I can do it. Now, we didn't have any money, so I got an old John McEnroe Dunlop wooden racket, but I knew my mind was a sponge, so I would sit down on the side of the court and listen to the pro teach the other kids, and I figured, and it's just like you're not, gonna, I'm sure, going to get into this conversation about masterminds, right? Who are you surrounding yourself with in your business? And I knew if I could get those good kids to play with me, I could get better. And so that's what I did. I happened to, you know, a year and a half later, make it on the high school team. And I played number six. Only the top six got to play singles. Now, I was blessed again because the other five girls on the team all came from money, all started playing when they were five years old, which most good tennis players do, right? Mm -hmm. And they, came, they all went to Piermont Oaks Country Club. So they all had a private coach. So not only did I get to play with girls that were better than me, this coach kind of took a liking to me and he noticed that I would pay attention. So he would call me up and he'd say, hey, Carol, I'm going to be working on Lauren's forehand. You want to come return forehands? I'm like, yeah, because he knew I would listen to what he was teaching her. Now, fast forward to the end of my junior year. Now, my dad's from the deep south and he kind of looked down his nose at me. He says, now, Carol, you need to get a job or you need to get an academic scholarship because I can't send you to college. And I said, but dad, I'm going to get a tennis scholarship. <laughs> he paused and he looked down his nose at me again. He said, like I said, get a job <laughs> or get an academic scholarship. Now, how I translate that from a business perspective is that often as entrepreneurs, we want our family and our friends to support us in our vision. But here's the thing. God didn't give our vision to them. He gave it to us. And it's our responsibility to surround ourselves with the people who will lift us up or give us a hand up when we need it. And Jerry kept believing in me. So I chose to trust in his vision for me until I could believe it for myself. And at the end of my senior year, as a matter of fact, I was so blessed to be on that team because we won the national high school championships that year out of San Antonio. I got three full scholarship offers to schools I did not want to go to. I am a fighting LSU tiger, even <laughs> to this day. And my doubles partner was going there. So I got a half scholarship and I took out a loan and off I went. Guess what? I started playing number six again, which I was excited because I'm playing. Now the girls are way better than me. Now, here's one of the first things I teach when I talk about becoming a professional athlete in your business. You show up every day, no matter what you feel like. Mm -hmm. Athletes make business decisions, right? They don't make emotional, I don't feel like it decisions. Mm -hmm. So at the end of my freshman year, Here's step number two in being a professional athlete in your business. 
Sometimes you have to practice when everybody else is resting. That doesn't mean you become a workaholic, but at the end of my freshman year, the rest of the team took off. I went and got on the 21 and under tour. Now this is back in the day when you could hitchhike. I didn't have any money, right? So I'm hitching rides and I'm making sure that I'm one of the top seeds because if you were a top seed, then you got free housing. And I practiced with a lot of the guys. I mean, I would come home with bruises. Let me tell you, they would hit the ball so hard. I couldn't get out of the way. I come back for tryouts in August, all of the same girls on the team, one new freshman. And I went from playing number six to number two. And by the end of that semester, I went from playing number two to number one. And I played number one the rest of my career at LSU and became the team captain. So I'd been stepping into these leadership roles long before I became a business leadership coach. Mm -hmm. that translated into I was on the professional tour bunch of injuries I made enough money to pay my way but it just wasn't going anywhere as a matter of fact the last injury I had you probably won't believe this in October of 1985 I had custom made rackets from Wilson and I gave them to four what I called little old ladies at the time that's my age right now 61 right that's my age and I gave my rackets away and I really haven't played since. It was very difficult for me to go to playing at such a high level yeah. to playing just for fun. And lo and behold, I went through a divorce in the, in the spring of 87. You asked how I got here. I'm going to give the short version. Great. And my go, going through a divorce and my car caught on fire and the insurance wouldn't pay for it. Now, I knew I didn't want to be a tennis teaching professional my whole life. My background was in criminal law. I still didn't know what I wanted to do. Who's, who's there with me, right? And uh, I called my dad. Now, my dad's been in the insurance business for 30 years. Here's what he said to me. He says, now, Carol, you know I ain't in that kind of insurance. But if you come home, I got somebody who will help you get a car, even if you don't have a job. I thought, well, that's cool. I went up. I got my very first new car. And off I went to Dallas, Texas. Now, what's important about this time frame, it was the spring of 1987. And the United States government had just broken up AT&T Monopoly with all the baby bills. So competition was fierce in the long distance market. And I got hired by Metro Media Communications. And the lady who hired me said, can you come in and meet my boss, the VP, tomorrow? So I said, sure. You know, I had on the Navy suit and the pearls. I'm so glad I don't have to wear pantyhose anymore, right? <laughs> so I go in and I meet with her and she kind of looks me up and down. She says, great, I'll see you in Miami in a week. I said, no, you won't. Now, mind you, I needed a job. I was like, look, I'm interviewing in Dallas. You have an office here. My friends from the tennis tour are here. And my family's three and a half hours away. I'm working in Dallas. Pretty ballsy, right? She calmly looks me up and down again. And she says, but I need somebody really strong in Miami in a week. I said, how do you know I'm strong? I've never done this before. She said, just trust me and be there in a week. And so I did. And it turned into a more than 26 year successful sales career for Fortune 100 companies. So those were the two, two of the three pivotal times in my life where I chose to trust in someone else's vision for you, for me, until I could believe it for myself. And that's one of the things I do for my clients. One of the foundational pieces I do for my clients is to help them step into who they were created to be, mm -hmm. not who they think they are from the story that they've brought with them. Mm -hmm. And so that together we throw an anchor into their future so they can let go of that story from the past. And so I love holding that space and holding that vision. So there I was, summer of 2014, I'd sold over $70 million in revenue, walked the stages, got me awards, managed the people. I could do this in my sleep. I thought I had it made. Until the day I got that phone call and they told me they were cutting my territory by 80%. And I said, 80%? I've been building this territory for six and a half years. Now, you don't have to tell me twice. I thought they were setting me up to fail. Now, just so you know, I was a weird salesperson. I loved corporate structure and I'm a rule follower. Not true for most salespeople, right? Someone whispered in my ear about an opportunity at a really, really small company, very different from ATT Sprint and Paycheck. So I figured, ah, I'll go. And after two interviews, they gave me the job. They doubled my base salary plus commissions and they gave me a director title. I thought I could just see the potential. Now there I was six weeks into the job, on vacation. I negotiated it up front because I'd paid for it. And I was doing what I thought at the time was being a good employee. I was staying in touch with my boss, the CEO, while I was on vacation. What, what does Maya Angelou teach us? We do the best we can with what we have, but when we learn better, we do better. 
I don't advocate that for my clients anymore, but there I was. And I get this email asking my opinion on something. So I replied right back. And I waited because he usually replies right back. 12 hours later, we came in from dinner and cocktails and ding, there goes my phone. Carol Boston, you've got mail. And here's what it said. It said, Carol, comma, that's what you really think. And it had five question marks behind it. Then it said, don't come into this office on Monday when your vacation is over. You're done here. I was like, what? <laughs> I don't get, what? I don't get fired. I've been doing this for 27 years, right? I just got fired in an email, <laughs> right? On vacation. On vacation. Now, here's one of the things, one of the reasons I really work to help my clients advocate for themselves is because I didn't do it. Florida is an at-will state. I figured they can fire you for anything. And I just came back and had an interview the very next day. And I interviewed all over this country, sometimes three, think of the money corporations paid on me, three and four interviews deep. Crickets. And I thought, how ironic that I could sell $70 million worth of revenue for somebody else and I can't close a deal to get myself a job, right? Now, I've did this for so many months, you wouldn't believe it. I mean, I depleted my 401k. Why was that? My next book coming out next year is going to be called, You Can't Read the Label When You're Inside a Jar. And we're all in a jar, right? That's why we all need a good coach. And there I was in my jar. All I could see is I am a buttoned up corporate sales professional. So faith is my foundation and that's where I always go. So there I was in my prayer time many months into this. And I'm like, God, honestly, Colleen, I was really yelling at this point. And I'm like, look, you created me. I am not cut out to be an entrepreneur. I do not want to own my own business. You have got to help me find a good job. Literally two weeks to the day from that prayer. Out of the blue, I get an email from a woman that I met one time out of town at a conference. She and I must have chatted maybe 30 minutes. Guess what she did? She gifted me a $3,500 ticket to go to Los Angeles to study at Gorilla Business School. Now, I tell people my God has a sense of humor, right? Because Gorilla Business School was a foundational school for entrepreneurs. What, what the hell? <laughs> so I didn't know what I didn't know, and off I went. And the very first thing I learned was what caused me to title my next book, You Can't Read the Label When You're Inside a Jar. And the second thing I learned is what turned me into the Queen of Reframe. And it was about empowering questions. And I was amazed at their power. And I'll be candid with you. I'm stunned at the number of not just people, but coaches even that don't know truly how to craft an empowering question. So I studied that in leadership with the best. Nirka, Michael Strasner, you know, John Maxwell. This is May of 2015. This part of my journey started. Fast forward to the fall of 2017. I had two coaching certifications. I was coaching people. Guess what I was still doing? I had these three very unique services that I was still trying to sell into corporate America. And then I learned there's a big difference between being committed and being convicted because people decommit every day, don't they? They say, I'm committed to this marriage for life <laughs> until the day I'm not. But when you're convicted, you won't rest until you get it done. And you understand that your comfort and your convenience and your conviction don't live on the same block. They're not even in the same zip code. And at that point, I let go of those three services. And if we have time, I can tell you another thing that happened right then. It was a pivotal time. The third pivotal time, it's how I became a professional speaker because I trusted in someone else's vision for me. And I don't know if you want to hear that story or just kind of fast. You do? No, go ahead. Share it. <laughs> You're on a roll. And I know my listeners are just like loving this right now. So there I was in December of 2017, December 9th to be exact. And where was I? I was at Nova Southeastern University. I'd met with this lady a couple of times and I was trying to do what? Still sell those three services. This is right before I gave them up into HR of these big corporations. And she knew a little bit about my coaching. And we walked back across campus and she paused and she looked me up and down. It's something about these women that look me up and down, right? And she goes, I know what I'm going to do for you. I said, what? She goes, I'm going to hire you. I said, to do what? She said, to speak. I said, to speak? She goes, don't give me that bullshit. You're a speaker. I'm like, who am I going to speak to? <laughs> and she said, I'm going to put you in front of 55 to 60 of the top HR people of the major corporations in South Florida. And I thought, I'm in the frying pan. It's December the 9th. I said, when am I going to do this? And she said, March. I said, March? How long am I speaking for? She said, 90 minutes. I was like, 90 minutes? She goes, don't give me that. Send me your CV and your fees. My fees? Somebody's going to pay me to speak? 
Now, as God would have it, I had moved into a new office that year. And this talk, this 90 minute workshop got moved from March to August the 9th. Very important. And I met two women at that time. One became my content writer. She helped me write content for my workshop and my talks. And another lady was in HR. She wanted me to give a workshop to Kaiser University, but she wasn't the final decision maker. And they kept giving me a really hard time. So they went so far as to say, we don't think you're right for our group. And I persevered. And my content writer said, just say no. I said, mm -mm -mm, I am not going to Nova and getting paid and never having done one of these before. So I finally get in. I do my one at Kaiser. I come back and I readjust to the new one at Nova. Me and two of my best friends show up at Nova at quarter of seven in the morning. It was a breakfast event. Now, bear in mind, there was two of us that were going to teach. The other lady had 15 titles behind her names. She had written a book on the brain and all these other kind of things. And then there's Carol Boston. I'm here to tell you, folks, titles don't mean anything, right? Titles don't mean anything. You don't have to have a title to be a leader, no, right? No. So we walk into the room and there was this man with this booming voice and he goes, Carol Boston, really loud across the room. And the lady who hired me looked at me and I looked at her and she goes, Barry, do you know Carol? And he goes, she's the only reason I came today. I thought, oh my God. Oh my God. <laughs> he and I had worked together for 10 years in the 90s at AT&T. So I decided I would go help this lady set up and get to know this speaker. And I'm helping her set up and she leans into me. She says, so Carol, how long have you been on the circuit? I said, what circuit? <laughs> One day. She, Today, <laughs> she, she looks at me and I said, uh, and she goes, the speaking circuit. I said, oh, I'm not supposed to tell you. <laughs> and she says, why not? I said, oh, last Thursday was my first one. This is my second one. Now, she either looked at me like I had lost my mind or they had lost my mind because they paid me to show up. Now, mind you, they paid her more money. Think about this. They told me that they paid her more money because she had written a book. So she went first. And to be candid, she just lost the room. Um, it did not go well for her. I, I felt bad for her. It got to be close to my turn and I went out to the restroom and I'm out in the back and I'm stretching. The lady who hired me comes up, grabs me by the shoulders. She is in my face. You are going to increase the energy in the room, aren't you? <laughs> Absolutely. I'm just concerned that 90 minutes isn't long enough for my content. <laughs> she goes, you're going to give us content, right? You're not using those damn slides, are you? No, nope, no slides. I don't use slides. She said, okay, good. Now, here's the first lesson I learned as a professional speaker. Make your own time cards. Make them in big, bold, red, black ink, whatever. Make your own. I didn't know that. So she said she'd keep my time. So things get going. Things are going well. And I didn't realize that she wrote my time card in this little bitty bit thing. And there's 53 people in the room. She's all the way across the room when she holds up the first time card. So I just kind of chuckle. And I'm like, no, I can't read that. <laughs> and so she tells me. And I get everybody involved in an exercise. And I went to her. I said, I have more than 30 minutes. I have 45. We started late. She was, oh, yeah, let me rework this. So she did. Time goes by. I have no concept of time at this point. I'm in my element. And she's at the back of the room next to my BFF who was taking video. And she holds up another one. Now, everybody in the room laughs because they know I can't read it. And I thought they both spoke at the same time. And I thought they said three minutes. And my brain went, three minutes? I said, give me four and I'll wrap this up. And so I did. And everybody stepped up and they were clapping, clapping, clapping. She made a beeline around that room and got in my ear. She said, I didn't say three minutes. I said 30, sit them down and teach them something because <laughs> they're getting CEUs, right? Yeah, said, they okay. have to have a certain amount of hours of training. Yeah. So I said, everybody, this is great. We have time for Q&A. Everybody sit back down. It was a God moment because the people, there were three people in the room that had actually, two had heard me at Kaiser, one knew me. And they said that last 30 minutes, I was totally in my element you know, just freeform teaching from the stage. One of the things you'll hear me say is that, and I'm going to give your audience some writer downers. I say they're writer downers. And during this 30 minutes, this lady up front goes, oh, that's another writer downer. And I said, yes, it is. And the thought went, I said, damn, these people actually listening to me, right? This is my second time to they listen. When all was said and done, a lady comes up to me and she says, my name is Jackie. I'm the vice president of human resources for American Express. I want you to come teach this to my people do you have a business card? And I said, yes. And I said, do you have a business card? And she said, no. Now I'm a salesperson. The first thought that went through my head was, mm -mm -mm. I'll never hear from her again. I got to have a way to follow up that I just quickly reframed. And I said, no, everything's going to work out for good. It's all going to work out for good. This was August the 9th, early September. She called me and that turned into me being hired by American Express six times in 2019 to teach and train because I trusted in that woman's vision for me that I was a speaker. 
You know, I, Carol, I, I am a just blown away by your story. I know everyone has just been enthralled in it as much as I have. You are a fantastic speaker, fantastic storyteller. And the one thing that keeps coming up from me is if God had not intervened when he did and closed all those doors for you, you would have kept pounding the pavement to become a, a, an employee in corporate America. And Absolutely. I have a very similar story where doors just kept getting closed after, you know, being in corporate America for almost 30 years. And one to, you know, knowing that, hey, I've been working toward this position. I deserve this position. This is what I do. You know, I, I can prove on, you know, any paper what, you know, the millions of dollars I had brought to the company, but God had another plan. Mm -hmm. And no matter what we think, we, we are on God's time, not on our own time. And your faith and vision that you have with other people, it is so right. I use the picture in the frame. You know, if you're a picture in the frame, like you use inside the jar, oh, yeah. mm -hmm. um, you can't see the label. Right. When I've been coaching people for over 20 years, mm -hmm. when you are on a, on, on a, in a frame, in a picture on a wall, you can't see any of the house, but what's in front of what's in front of you. Yeah. Your coach can walk the whole lay of the home. You know, they <laughs> can right. tell you what's happening. And, you know, the, the surrounding yourself, let's talk about the masterminding, because mm -hmm. in my book that I'm reading for the 15th time, Think and Grow Rich, masterminding is the number one piece that he talks about, that you need to surround yourself with other people, which is why I'm leaving tomorrow to Breckenridge, because I have a mastermind that I created to surround myself with people mm -hmm of masters of the mind that I need to be able to push me to that next level that they need to be able to push them to that next level. Your network is your net worth. And I want, I want everyone to write that down. It is your net worth who you surround yourself with is going to be a huge tall tale of how successful you will be in your business. So let's talk about the reframe a little bit, because if you're the queen of reframe, give me an example of a client that you've reframed something so that my listeners understand what reframing is. For, okay, first let's talk just a little bit about empowering questions. Yeah. Empowering questions help you reframe from focusing on what isn't working. Most people keep looking at what's not working and what you focus on expands and they wonder why they keep getting more things that aren't working. So empowering questions cause you to be curious. They cause you to ponder. They will challenge your capacity. One of the key things they do is they help take the emotion out of the conversation. Who wouldn't like that, right? Fewer arguments. They help you get other people on the same page as you easier and with less resistance. They create what I call Oprah aha moments. Now, one of the caveats of empowering questions, it kind of mirrors what Stephen Covey taught us in the book, Seven Habits of Highly Successful People, when he says, seek first to understand and then be understood. But the difference is in that second part with empowering questions, you are not trying to get somebody else to understand you. You use them to understand yourself because oftentimes we're the ones that are in resistance and we just don't know it, right? No, or, we're we're or, always the ones in resistance. But we want to blame other people, right? There's not even a sometimes. You are <laughs> always the one in resistance because you're always the one that can make the choices and the decisions. Absolutely. And there's power and choice. And only when you own that you're choosing, right, can you choose differently? Yeah. So back in 2018, I had an office and I had a client. The first time she came to see me, she was right on time. Second time, a little late. Third time, a little later. Fourth time, she was seriously late. Now, here's the first writer downer I want to give you about empowering questions. They never, ever, ever start with the word why, ever. Why is not going to get you the answer you want. Why brings in defensiveness, which brings in the ego, which brings in emotions. And when emotions go up, intelligence goes down. It's true for every human being. So I'm the shake your hand, give you a hug girl from corporate America. So I gave her a hug and I sat her down. And I said, get out your pen and paper. We don't want to miss this coaching opportunity. Now we don't typically start like that. So she's kind of looking at me. I said, I'm serious. So the first thing I had her write down is how I do anything is how I do everything. I would encourage your audience, write that down. And I bet you, as soon as you write that down, something defensive is going to come up. Like, well, that's not really true, Carol, but it is. And so what she's like any human being, what does she want to do? She wanted to give me a defensive story about why she's late. And I said, this isn't about you being late. She said, it's not. Now I want you to think about how many of you would have said to her, why are you always so late? <laughs> I didn't do that. We wouldn't have gotten anywhere. Yeah. And she said, it's not about being late. And I said, no. She said, what's it about? I said, it's about where else in your life are you not showing up for you? And she said, what? 
And I said, write it down. Where else in your life are you not showing up for you? I said, you pay me in advance for my time. I'm not giving you any money back and I'm not giving you extra time because I have a schedule of clients that I keep. So she writes it down, Colleen, she looks at me, she goes, is that my homework for the week? I said, honey, that's your homework ad nauseum. I want it on your dashboard, your mirror, your refrigerator, your shower. See, here's another caveat for empowering questions. You put them out to God in the universe out loud six to eight times a day, and you do not sit around trying to figure them out. The answers are outside of your jar. If they were in your jar, you wouldn't have to be asking the question. Mm -hmm. When you put these questions out, you're telling God in the universe, I'm open to hearing, seeing, saying, or doing something I've never thought of before. Mm -hmm. So I asked her if she would do that six to eight times a day, and she said yes. So I don't know how many weeks went by, but there we were working on some kind of business challenge, and all of a sudden her eyes flew open. I said, what's up? She said, that's another place I'm not showing up for me. Yes. And as she began to get these awarenesses of the habits that weren't serving her, we were able to replace them with better leadership habits. And in six months, we doubled the income in her business mm -hmm. by opening that awareness. Isn't that interesting? Because so many leaders, and I, I, I love that you talked about titles, you know, they're earned. They're, you're, you earn leadership. You yes. earn leadership through respect, through love, through um, your leadership abilities. Uh, the, the word leadership is very clearly defined as others are following you. Yes. So therefore, if you're assigned leadership, you really don't have any followers, you're forced followers uh, right. based on that. So that the, the titles don't mean anything, you're right. And, 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 and as you mentioned and talked about reframing, how wonderfully refreshing it is for a reminder that the answers sometimes are beyond where our scope of, of what we believe that we can acquire the answer. Yes. And it comes to trust and faith. Yes. Again, the desire, do you have the desire to want to be the best you could possibly be, the best leader that you want to be? Do you have the faith and do you believe it's possible? And that all starts with you. We, yes. no, no other human can instill that in you. Mm -hmm. We can only ask the powerful questions for you to believe it yourself. And you had even said that a couple of times. And you said that about your client. She doubled her income for one reason. She became a better version of a leader for her yes. business. Period. Absolutely. Absolutely. She didn't come up with a silver bullet and the number one marketing idea. And it wasn't because she hired another company that came in and did something great for her company. It was her. Absolutely. And one of the, the coaching I do is very customized, very personalized, but there's a foundational piece. It's step one in my seven steps to an unstoppable business. And it's entitled become the lion or lioness leader. And it's about my clients getting truly clear on who they were created to be. So one of the things I take my private clients through in this particular process is we create 10 to 12 empowered statements for them. And often these statements are a stretch. So this particular female family lawyer uh, had owned her own practice for four years, hired me. And one of the statements I crafted for her was, I'm a powerful CEO of a fast growing law firm. She looked at me like I had lost my mind. She goes, my law firm isn't growing. Why the hell do you think I hired you? She was not happy with me, right? So in with my private clients, I have a couple of phrases that I will give them to put in front of it when the stretch is too big. And that's where we started with her. And it was maybe three, I don't know, four months down the road. And she was taller than me. I had an office, right? She was taller and she had on heels. So one day she comes in and I'm looking up at her and she owns it for the first time. She goes, I'm a powerful CEO of a fast growing law firm. Her testimonial on my website, part of it will tell you that she got more clients in six months of working with me than she had in the first four years of her practice. Part of that was owning what? She had a fast growing law firm. We create as we speak. It's biblical. God says, call things that aren't as though they are. You must believe and then you see. So I help my clients get clear on who they were created to be. Now, February 28th of this year, I did my first live speaking engagement since COVID. It happened to be at a luncheon that she was co-chairing. So after I spoke and I sat down to eat lunch, she sat down and we were chatting and I said, so how's business? She goes, oh my God, I just hired another paralegal, just hired another assistant. I'm bringing on an associate on board. It's still growing. This is three years later because she stepped into her power to own that, who she was created to be. What a wonderful message today, Carol. And since you talked about your website, let's share with our listeners how can they get in contact with you? How can they reach out to you? If, if someone listening wants to hire you to speak, 
Give us all of all of the juice of where we find you. <laughs> um, my website is real simple, www.carolboston.com. For Facebook and Instagram, it's at the Carol Boston. For LinkedIn, they changed it. It's at the Carol Boston Coaching. Um, I would invite you today is Wednesday. Every Wednesday, 5.30 p.m. Eastern, I do a live Facebook show on my personal page, Craft Cocktails with Carol. We have an absolute blast. I create two cocktails. We weave in. So I've actually gotten clients from a craft cocktail show. How cool is that? We weave in a little bit of business and we, oh my God, the stories, the funny stories that come out, come join me. Let me know you're there. Uh, we just have a blast. And that's another way you can find and see what I do. Um, and I have Carol's Courage to Confidence Corner there on that same page. Awesome. Is that 530 Pacific Standard Time, Eastern? Eastern. Eastern Standard Time. Okay, so just so that everyone's clear. And I'll put that information in the details. And for those of you listening to this podcast, uh, now you know that you can go follow her. We have all of her links below. So you guys can just click on them from your fingertips and get right over to her Facebook page to join her on Wednesday. So if you love to craft cocktails and you mm -hmm. want to just talk about some fun business stories, that's the place to go. So Carol, you've been just probably one of my most amazing guests that I've ever had on my show Thank today. You. I am, you have an infectious personality and energy. I love everything you stand for. And you are, you are the epitome of conviction of what you do, of how you change others' lives and actually empower them yes. to change their own lives because we're not magicians as, no. coaches. you know, we're empowering others to change their lives. And it's so nice to meet a fellow uh, corporate employee that followed the rules was the perfect employee did everything they should be yeah. and then you found yourself dropped into entrepreneurship which was the plan for us to be here and now empower others exactly and if i could just add one thing to that for your audience that's listening is it sometimes the path you fear the most is the one you're meant to be on and so i would encourage you that all you have to do this is what i've been doing Trust in the process and take the next step. I believe that God only gave me a lamplight for my feet because all I need to see is the next step. And maybe one day I'll come back and tell you that after I sold my house, God saw fit for me to move nine times in 18 months while trying to grow a business. We can talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we will have a recap on that for sure. I'll have you back, Carol. Thank you. And remember, everyone, you're the only you that's ever been. You are the only you that will ever be. Yes. How you navigate your path and your future's up to you. It's your choice. And I love what Carol said, how you do anything is how you do everything. Yes. Remember to surround yourself with a network of people that have a high net worth, meaning they have a lot that they want to give you. They mm -hmm. want to uh, share with you, lift you, fuel you. That's who you should be surrounding yourself with. So Carol, again, thank you so much for joining thank us you. today. And for all of you, don't forget, be you and be strong. We'll talk to you next week. Bye-bye now.